dear professors and colleagues, I'm Heba Fouad, an assistant professor at Cairo University, and this is a quick reminder of our last episode. An 11 years old child presented with diplopia for eight days with no history of past or current illness. Also, he had no history of trauma. Ophthalmological examination showed bilateral best corrected visual acuity of 66 with bilateral normal fundi. He was orthotropic in primary position and he had diplopia inside gazes confirmed with the worth four dot test. And this was the video of the child at the first presentation showing ocular motility. He had bilateral limited adduction with bilateral abduction nystagmus and he showed an upbeat nystagmus on upgaze. MRI brain and cervical spine was requested with contrast but unfortunately it was done without contrast and it was completely normal. MRA brain was also normal. VEP showed bilateral slightly delayed response. So it's a case of bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia for differential diagnosis. Patient disappeared and we had to contact him to see him for a follow up. And finally, he showed up six weeks later. He was prescribed low dose steroids by his neurologist. Ocular motility was completely normal after six weeks of low dose steroid use. Neurologist diagnosed the case as a viral infection or a post viral incident could be COVID-19, but that was not confirmed with the PCR. I would like to thank my dear professors, Dr. Gihad Nahri and Dr. Maish Arawi, Dr. Volk for accepting our invitation and looking forward to their valuable comments. Thank you. Thank you, dear Dr. Heba, for inviting me to appear on your Ramadan show. It's been always a pleasure. Internuclear ophthalmoplegia is a condition where the lesion lies in the medial longitudinal fasciculus, and the side of the lesion is of the inter of the medial longitudinal fasciculus will determine the what we call the, the right or left me, the internuclear ophthalmoplegia. It's internuclear because there, there is a link between the nucleus of the sixth nerve in pons and the, the subnucleus of the medial rectus in the midbrain. And the medial longitudinal fasciculus, when there is a disease such as demyelination, inflammation, as we're going to mention right now, it will cause a defect in adduction of this eye and the excessive impulses according to herring law to the lateral rectus will lead to the nystagmus we all see. On MRI, this picture should appear as a lesion in the medial longitudinal fasciculus in the brainstem. The causes of internuclear ophthalmoplegia in a child 11 year old, we should think first of demyelination and because of there is no disturbance of consciousness or something, we exclude Adam and Schilder disease and other diseases of demyelination and we can focus on MS or animal spectrum disorder. However, other causes can be inflammation as Bichette sarcoidosis, also like uh, systemic lupus. Infection as cryptococcosis or Lyme disease, which are not very common in, in our country. Tumors, ischemia, or trauma. So history is very important in this child because sometimes there are what we call invisible symptoms. The child may only have fatigue, for example, and this is a very significant sign in MS or symptom, uh, and maybe he has some electric current uh, down the back or, or other parathesia or very subtle symptoms that he may not notice. So history taking in such a case is really important and crucial. In demyelination, in order to diagnose a case of MS, you should have dissemination in time, which is not our case here, dissemination in space, and we, we will talk about now and exclusion of other mimicking conditions. 
the dissemination in space means that there are two attacks in two different areas. And now the VEP, which, which I want to thank you for much for ordering the VEP in this child with, and we detected here there is delay in latency. And this is an indicator of dissemination in space. And we still need the CSF, the oligoclonal bands, in order to diagnose MS. Because according to McDonald's criteria in 2017, the, the most recent modified criteria, having the oligoclonal bands in CSF can replace dissemination in time. So what I can do in such a case, I will order for visual field because I want to know if there is now any visual feed defects that away from the center and, and they can really indicate having optic neuropathies now, not detected because the patient has normal vision. We have to, to know there, if there is oligoclonal bands in CSF. The MRI, I would bring the patient back to the radiologist, ask him for gadolinium enhancement and asking him to focus on the area of brain stem and optic nerves. I would also like to ask him if there is any small black holes along the, the, the spinal cord or the brain that indicate previous attacks and the only leave area of, of after the demyelination, there is an area of defective uh, uh, nerve fibers. And I would give the child intravenous missile prednisolone one gram daily for one day for three days for five days up to seven days. And we observe for the, I mean the one gram per day, sorry. So we give it for three, five or seven days. The, and we observe for improvement. If the patient did not improve, I would search for aquaporin antibodies and antimog, which is very rare at this age, but aquaporin can be very useful not driven by the fact that the patient has bilateral optic neuropathy because even in children, MS can come as bilateral optic neuropathy. If the patient did not improve, I can give dalfampridine, which is the famous Ampera drug used in people with MS for walking. They improve the neurotransmission along the median longitudinal fasciculus. It's also important to exclude mimicking conditions due to vasculitis. And we have, if we, if we fail to know the exact cause after all the, the tests we have done already, we should ask for the vasculitic profile in order to detect any cause of vasculitis. And we should not ignore COVID-19, of course, in the era of COVID because this mysterious disease is something that we still don't know enough about. So we order for PCR to exclude any possibility of having COVID. Thank you so much for listening and it was a real pleasure for me to join your meeting. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nicholas Volpe. I am from Northwestern University in Chicago. And I thank very much the conference organizers who've invited me to comment on this interesting patient who presented with double vision and is presented to the audience by Dr. Faoud. The case per, as presented is that of a 11 year, six month old boy who presented with double vision for eight days, who is described as otherwise being completely healthy, presumably with no other neurologic illness and no other neurologic symptomatology. He presented with these symptoms for approximately eight days and the video and examination show fairly classic findings that as demonstrated show bilateral adduction deficits or inability to move the eye towards the nose, abducting nystagmus that is seen in lateral gaze in both directions where he develops double vision, presumably with an exotropia. And then the very classic finding of upbeat nystagmus in up gaze. The child was subsequently worked up and we are shown a normal MRI and a normal MRA scan. We're also told that the visual VOC response was abnormal with slight delay. Other findings I would note just looking at the pictures in the video is it does not appear that the child has ptosis or any vertical eye movement abnormalities beyond the nystagmus. And I believe that the pupils also look normal in these photographs and in the video. 
So as, as we approach patients like this, I think uh, it's a good exercise as outlined by our presenter to consider diagnosis, localization, and etiology. Uh, my preferred method would be to include one and two sort of in the same uh, breath, if you will, and try first to decide whether this is an eye movement problem, a cranial nerve problem, an eye muscle problem, a brain problem. All of these are possibilities. But in this particular case, given the classic findings, this patient undoubtedly has a bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia as evidenced by the bilateral adduction deficits along with the abducting nystagmus and the ver very classic finding of upbeating nystagmus in upgaze. The presence of the nystagmus, particularly in upgaze, really helps us to exclude some of the potential mimickers of internuclear ophthalmoplegia, such as myasthenia gravis or Miller-Fisher syndrome uh, or other orbital processes, which occasionally can cause adduction deficits, some which might be associated with what appears to be abducting nystagmus. But in this particular case, given both the good alignment in the primary position, as well as the associated up upbeating nystagmus, this undoubtedly is a bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And I think we don't need to really consider some of the mimickers of internuclear ophthalmoplegia that I discussed earlier. Uh, earlier. So when you have somebody with a bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia, undoubtedly this localizes to the brainstem, and in particular the medial longitudinal fasciculus, which as you know connects the sixth nerve to the third nerve. So when someone, for instance, is trying to look to the right, the right sixth nerve nucleus then tells the left medial rectus subnucleus of the third nerve to look to the right also. And this passage is through the medial longitudinal fasciculus in the posterior aspect of the brainstem connecting the pons and midbrain. Generally, when we see bilateral uh, internuclear ophthalmoplegia, we think of uh, space occupying or inflammatory lesions. The vast majority of brainstem syndromes can be ascribed to similar processes, neoplastic, vascular uh, in terms of ischemia or stroke, some type of encephalitis, and by far the most common etiology for this presentation would most likely be in an older adult who has demyelination in the setting of a clinically isolated syndrome or an early presentation of multiple sclerosis uh, as the likely etiology. I think it's a bit more complex here as we think about the differential diagnosis. A 12-year-old would be a, an unusual age to present with either a clinically isolated syndrome or with uh, multiple sclerosis. The entity uh, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis is a demyelinating-like illness that occur, occurs acutely, perhaps in a post-viral state or uh, in an, another trigger of some type of autoimmune inflammation. So my diagnosis is that this presumably is some type of inflammatory, uh, likely via a demyelinating mechanism involving both medial longitudinal fasciculi and causing the bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia. There are uh, a number of uh, considerations and some of which I think might be even more interesting in this era of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this patient, at least as described, does not have uh, what uh, is recognized as the pediatric multi-system inflammatory disorder, which is an immune-mediated me Kawasaki's-like disease uh, that can present with uh, a vasculopathy and vasculitis. I presume that might be why the MRI scan, MRA scan was done. Uh, those patients are generally much sicker, much more intensely ill, uh, have other systemic and cardiac mechanisms. Uh, I'm surprised that the MRI scan, and I'm not sure if all the different types of uh, necessary views were included, was normal. Usually, we would be able to identify a lesion affecting the MLF in a patient like this. It's certainly possible that the um, uh, lesion was uh, resolving or uh, had improved 
uh, prior to doing the scan. I think there are other possibilities potentially uh, in addition to the idiopathic ADEM type uh, presentation that could be related uh, to uh, a COVID-19 post event. Several patients have been reported with COVID-19 who developed cranial nerve palsies and supranuclear gaze abnormalities. Uh, mechanisms there could be via an autoimmune phenomena or some type of vasculopathy. So in this case, I would probably treat this child with steroids and watch closely for other evidence of demyelination or other neurologic illness and be very careful and mindful to work them up for other manifestations of systemic autoimmune or inflammatory disease. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, be very curious to know how this child does and did uh, while he was being cared for, whether treatment was initiated and whether the eye movement abnormality resolved. Thank you. Good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, I wish to thank Heba Fouad for asking me to comment on this interesting and rare case. If we look at the motility video, we will see that the child has bilateral limitation of adduction, more on the right side, together with an abducting nystagmus more evident on the left side. These two findings could support the diagnosis of an internuclear ophthalmoplegia of acute onset of post-viral etiology or uh, demyelinating condition. However, there are other very important clinical signs. There is a bilateral asymmetrical ptosis, which is more evident on the left side, together with left brow elevation. Also on up gaze, there is a gaze evoked pendular vertical nystagmus. These two findings, in my mind, support the diagnosis of acute onset of ocular myasthenia. This is a rare condition that has been reported in 2020 by Huber et al. following COVID-19 infections. So uh, what I wanted to see in this video is a test of convergence, which I think is not intact in this case, which further supports the diagnosis of myasthenia. Also, I would have uh, liked to see the child investigated in that direction by doing serum anticholinesterase antibodies and a chest x-ray or a CT scan for the evidence of the presence of a thymoma. So the findings of weakness of bi bilateral weakness of adduction, a gaze evoked nystagmus, bilateral asymmetrical ptosis with brow elevation, uh, supports the diagnosis of ocular myasthenia in my, in my mind. Uh, what I uh, would also have loved to see that uh, the video has just stopped before demonstrating Kogan's lit witch sign. The child has looked downwards for 10 to 15 seconds and then has been looking straight forward, but the uh, video was cut. Thank you very much.